Good morning, everyone. So this is a slide that I start a lot of ESG presentations with. And usually I just show it in passing because it sort of establishes that ESG is becoming, it's very fast becoming a mainstream theme. I mean, 30.7 trillion in assets now being managed with an ESG theme. And we see compound growth happening globally. So there's a lot going on in ESG right now. But I don't think that the, I mean, the numbers are impressive, but I think the more interesting thing here is the story behind the numbers. Because at this point, we all take it for granted that ESG is pretty much a mainstream theme. But when you think about it, ESG is a pretty unusual thing to have happened in finance, or at least very unexpected thing to have happened in finance. When I look back 15 years or so ago in finance, the idea that there'd be this room full of, pe of people in the markets who were this interested in ESG, I would not have believed it. So I want to explore that a little bit more. And I want to do that by answering, or at least trying to answer, five questions. First, where did ESG even come from? Second, how have investors been using ESG in the last 10 years or so? Third, and I think this is a really interesting one, what's happened in particular in the last three or four years that's made ESG, ESG go from this sort of tiny little niche thing to this massive explosive growth? That's been a really interesting thing. And fourth, now that ESG is getting this traction and is becoming a mainstream theme, how is it changing? How is the way it's being used sort of changing? And then the final thing is, what's next? Where do we expect this trend to go? So I'll first start off by giving a little bit of background on myself. So I worked in the Bloomberg Index Group. I worked at uh, Barclays before that. So I came into Bloomberg when Bloomberg bought the Barclays fixed income family which is the most widely used fixed income family in the market. Now, that puts us in a great position to, to see a lot of what's happening in the market, a little, bit of head, a little bit ahead of when it starts to happen. So we're always working with asset managers and asset owners, and we're seeing those trends play out constantly, a little bit before they happen. Now, when I was at Barclays, um, all the way back in 2012, we partnered with MSCI to create the market's first ESG integrated fixed income index family. Now, for a good long time, really not much happened with that index family. It took a long time for fixed income investors in particular to warm up to the idea of using ESG. So that, I guess that was the downside of creating the family that early. The upside was that we were in a position where we had sort of a front row seat to see the ESG trend really evolve over time and to see where it came from. And so that brings me to the first question here. Where did ESG come from? So ESG proper, I have to make sure I'm, yeah. ESG uh, is something that existed long before ESG was sort of a brand name thing, right? Investors and asset owners wanted to divest for certain sec uh, from certain sectors just because they had values-based interests. So, I mean, the best example here is just religious mandates. A lot of religious funds would come to us as benchmark providers because they couldn't invest in certain things in their portfolio. They couldn't invest in alcohol, firearms, et cetera. So an aspect of ESG predated ESG as being the big brand name thing that it is now. Now, ESG proper, I think, really came to the forefront following the 2008 financial crisis. Why is that? Well, basically investors realized there was this huge component of unpriced risk. So they started looking for factors that potentially weren't in credit ratings or weren't in other risk analysis. And they started looking for things that were going to speak to the long-term viability of firms. And that's what ESG was. Now, also in the wake of the financial crisis, we had things like reputational risk and regulatory risk take far more prominence, right? Because there was a lot more scrutiny of companies' behaviors and that they were governing and managing themselves for the long term. So that's why I think that's where ESG started to really start to gather traction. Now, we're at the point now where 
ESG is in its sort of mature phase, which means that for a lot of you, your firms are probably, if you're, if you're in the credit markets, you're using ESG just as a standard part of your credit analysis. And you might have internal teams of ESG experts who are working on integrating it across your firm's entire portfolio. Also, you know, whereas people were perfectly content before using these sort of prepackaged ESG ratings, now people are really wanting to dive down and understand the factors that are driving those ESG ratings. So now how have investors been using ESG? I think there's four main areas. First is in portfolio construction. So making asset allocation decisions based on ESG. The second is in sort of monitoring and risk management. So here you're not necessarily making the allocation decisions based on ESG, but you're looking out for things. You're looking for sort of tail risk events uh, based on ESG red flags that are happening. The third is impact investing. And then finally, reporting. So reporting is becoming a bigger and bigger part because there's new regulations that are coming into place, but also investors now just are scrutinizing portfolios a lot more. They want to know what their money is actually going into. So I think that these are the four main areas. Now, how has it actually been used? So I think there are three different phases of ESG use. The first phase was asset managers basically responding to market demand, doing what asset managers do. So there was this thing ESG, people wanted to buy it or put money into it. So they're going to create products or they're going to create funds. I mean, care too much what, an ESG rating was. So when we started working with clients back then, you know, they found it interesting, but what they cared about most was that there was demand for it. So they wanted to create products to meet that demand. Second phase has been asset owner driven. So as asset owners have started to shift billions in funds into ESG, asset managers very quickly are responding to that. So basically RFPs now are almost by default, including these ESG factors, which means that asset managers, if they wanna win large mandates, have to show that they have ESG capability. So the second phase was sort of a scramble by asset managers to develop these in-house ESG capabilities, which have only increased over time. And then the final phase, has been, uh, is going to be regulation. So, I'll talk about that a lot more because I think that that's going to be the thing that really drives ESG into being just standard across all investments. Okay, so now what do the actual products and funds that people are creating look like? And again, we work with about 60 clients now. We've created you know, a lot of different ETFs and a lot of different funds based on our index family. So we have a lot, we have pretty good insight into, into the types of things people are creating. Now, as you all know, ESG is a very, very broad umbrella. On one hand, you have ESG as this values-based thing. So screening out things that are alcohol, tobacco, firearms, fossil fuels, things along those lines. On the other hand, the ESG rating itself is meant to be a measure of risk, essentially, of material risk to a firm. That's just based on these non-financial factors. So I think when people look at ESG, and even when they look at ESG ratings, they're still seeing those things that go into the ratings, things like pollution, diversity, climate change, things along those lines, as being value-oriented. But the ESG lens is really meant to say, if you're polluting, you know, are there going to be regulations introduced that create costs because you need to make new investments? Or are there gonna be lawsuits that come as a result of some of these issues? So it's really supposed to be about financial materiality. People still think of it very much as being a sort of a do good theme. So I would say that that's still the way that the market thinks about ESG, sort of with this, this do good lens rather than either risk mitigation or opportunity. And that's what we're seeing in terms of product creation. So to speak specifically about products, I have to give you a little bit of background on what our fixed income ESG indices actually look like. So we have these three methodologies. One of them is SRI, so just excluding the most commonly excluded controversial business issues. The second one is sustainability. So that one only invests in the top ESG rated issuers within the index. And then the final one is more of a strategy. So it's ESG weighted where you tilt 
the market values or you change the allocations in the index based on the company's ESG rating and that rating's momentum. So these are the three standard ESG methodologies we have. We then take the US aggregate index or the Canada aggregate index or the global aggregate index. We layer these on top of them. So these are applied to our standard flagship indices. Now, one of these is a values-based methodology and two of them are ratings-based with the ESG weighted one being sort of more strategy oriented. And I can tell you that for the two ratings based one, sustainability and ESG weighted, we've literally never had a client just license those out of the box. Every single client that's licensed those indices has done some form of customization where they're removing uh, some controversial business. So they're removing things like uh, either the alcohol, tobacco, or more commonly, I'd say these are the, the most common exclusions that we're seeing right now, fossil fuels, controversial weapons, um, things along those lines. So basically, the market's not ready to accept products that are just pure ESG. Basically, there's an expectation that if I put my money into something that's called ESG, it's not going to have certain things in it. And the market is very, very sensitive about it not having things in it. We saw an instance not too long ago where there was an error uh, by another index provider, not us, that included, I believe it was firearms in the index. And that made actually uh, headlines uh, because that the, the index was branded as being an ESG index. So now to that question, what has it been that's happened in the last few years that's brought ESG from being just sort of a, a more niche thing to be having explosive growth. And the chart you see on your right there is the number of ETFs and the AUM in those ETFs for indices that we've been creating off of our index family. Now, I would say that there's three main things that have been driving the growth of ESG. The first is that the market's becoming less tolerant of ESG incidents. And they're also seeing that ESG incidents can have a very, very large impact. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Second, like I was talking about before, asset owners now are allocating a lot more funds into this. They're willing to actually put their money into the theme. So it's not just in theory anymore. And then finally, we're seeing that there's far more belief in, but more importantly, there's far more evidence of ESG not having a negative impact on performance. And in fact, in a lot of cases, having a positive impact on performance. Oh God, I pressed one. Okay. So um, speaking to the first thing about ESG incidents, right? So we've seen the BP oil spill. We've seen the Volkswagen emission scandal. We've seen things like data privacy related issues. Uh, Target was affected by that. Facebook's been affected by that. We see the impact it has on credit spreads and on stock prices. And we see that it's very significant. So these are ESG related issues that very clearly are having a major impact on asset prices. Second, and this, this is, these headlines are actually a little bit even dated now, but we see firms like Allianz, um, Swiss Re, uh, GPIF in Japan, allocating billions of dollars. In the case of Swiss Re, shifting their entire portfolio to having an ESG lens. And since these ones, there's actually been a lot more asset owners that are making these major shifts in assets to ESG. And then finally, on the research side. So I think a lot of investors have been waiting a long time to start to see the quantitative research actually support this ESG theme that's starting to happen now. So we have a group in Bloomberg, a quantitative research group. They put a bunch of papers out that if you have the terminal, you can find INP go. So basically what these papers are showing, uh, at least on the fixed income side, but I think that this is echo echoed in equities as well, is that ESG, first of all, doesn't affect performance. The performance of an ESG benchmark is comparable to our flagship benchmarks in a lot of cases, we're seeing just a small amount of outperformance from using ESG when you control for other risk factors. And then finally, and importantly, uh, especially in, uh, on the fixed income side, there's some downside risk mitigation that's offered by certain ESG factors. So I definitely encourage you to, to check out these, uh, these papers on the terminal. So 
now that ESG does have this traction, how is that changing how it's being used? Well, as I mentioned before, a lot of firms now have in-house expert teams on ESG. So we're seeing a lot more sophistication in the types of indices, the types of funds and products that are being created. Um, for example, we've been creating a good handful now uh, with a number of clients optimized ESG indices. And clients who are using the indices, it's not so much about screening anymore. It's about actually using the tilting methodologies that are sort of more strategy oriented and potentially offer that outperformance. So people are thinking of ESG, some people are thinking at least of ESG as more of a factor that can help them improve performance. Now, another major trend that we're seeing is that people are sort of unhappy just with the pre-boxed ESG ratings. They think that they're, the current ratings in the market are a little bit too opaque. They wanna see what are the factors that are going into these ratings? How are they being weighted? How are they actually influencing changes in ratings? Because if you have a lot of money invested in these indices, you want to know why the ratings are change, changing. So a lot of firms are doing things like licensing uh, ratings from a number of different providers. So you'll get MSCI, Sustainalytics, and a handful of others, and creating an aggregate rating from all of those. But we're seeing a lot more that other investors want to actually get all of that underlying factor data and build their own ESG rating out of that. And an example of that that we've had recently was State Street. So State Street created an ESG rating that's based on the SASB framework, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but it's an open and transparent uh, ESG ratings framework. So our factor is the first SASB based ESG rating. And we worked with them to create a handful of both equity and fixed income indices based on their R factor. Now, I expect this to continue. I expect a lot of firms to be looking to create their own ratings. So the perspective that we're taking, at least in the index business at Bloomberg, is that we wanna be agnostic about the rating source. So we'll work with anyone. If you have a rating that you think is the right rating to use, we'll work with you to create an index or create a product based on that rating. We believe that that's the approach to take as these ratings are gonna proliferate in the market. So final topic that I wanna to talk about today is what's next. And sorry to say it's not exactly a barn burner answer because my answer is regulation. Um, over time, we've seen a number, basically globally, we've seen different regulation introduced, but so far, it's mostly been either guidelines or it's been principles-based. But now the EU has introduced its action plan, the EU action plan on sustainable finance, and it's going to have major repercussions throughout the market. So basically, especially if your firm has a global footprint, this is something that you definitely need to be aware of, but I think it's gonna have global implications one way or another. So again, the difference with the EU action plan is that it's a binding legislation, it's not guidelines. And it's gonna be enacted through existing legislation, things like USITS and things like MIFID. So it's going to affect a very, very broad swath of investment. And that's exactly what the EU wants. They want, they want it to have as broad an impact as it can and not only affect the European Union, but also have an effect globally. Now the two areas that we're most specifically looking at are the reporting component and the climate benchmark component. Now from a reporting side, there's sort of three different types of obligations. For index providers, they're looking for us to start reporting ESG factors as well as carbon profiling for literally all of our indices. So I showed before that early slide where we have tens of thousands of indices now. So we're going to have to sort of publicly disclose for all of our indices these ESG factors as a standard thing. For asset managers, they're gonna be expected to start disclosing how they're integrating ESG into uh, portfolios publicly. Now, the fact that they are disclosing it publicly, I think is going to mean they're doing it a lot more. So we're gonna see a lot more ESG use coming out of that. Finally, for companies, there are going to be standard uh, ESG factor disclosures that come into place based on what sector you're in. So the same way that you need to do fi financial disclosures now, you're gonna be required to disclose these certain sets of ESG factors. 
a positive thing for ESG ratings creators there is that it's going to make that data much more open and transparent. And hopefully what that will lead to is at least more correlation between existing ESG ratings. Because if you look, if you compare different ESG ratings right now, they actually don't correlate too well, which is problematic. Now on the climate side, you know, the evidence that we're seeing of this, you know, I talked before about the fact that it took a long time for ESG itself to really pick up, but our green bond index really didn't pick up along with that. So it was only up, it was only this year that we really started to see a surge in interest in our green bond index. But now there's a lot of people looking to do, uh, do products in the green bond space. And again, Pretty much every index that we create right now, just as of this year in the ESG space, has now had standard uh, fossil fuel exclusions. So my guess and my expectation is that climate is really the next big thing in ESG. I think it's the ESG market is going to shift very heavily to a focus on climate. Now, another thing that's going to have a big influence on that is part of this EU regulation is creating, uh, the EU is creating standard methodologies for low carbon indices and spe specifically a carbon transition index and a Paris aligned benchmark. So they're expecting benchmark administrators like us to create indices that have the, that have lower carbon exposure and also are meeting annual carbon reduction targets. And there's going to be a huge amount of use of these types of indices in the EU and I expect globally soon after. So that's what we're working on now. That's what we're looking at right now. That's my broad overview of the, of the ESG space. I'll be around for the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the morning. So please feel free to approach me if you have any questions. Thank you very much.